with knowledge, doubt increases on the significance of knowledge in knowledge graphs. I start this particular talk with a quote from famous German writer Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, and you will see what is the importance, the significance of knowledge, in particular related to knowledge graphs that we use here to represent data, information and knowledge from many specific domains. First, I want to give you a brief overview of the context and background what my group, Information Service Engineering at Fitz Karlsruhe, is working on. One of our main building blocks is the creation of knowledge graphs for different kind of sciences. We start, for example, here in the realm of uh, plasma technology, where we create knowledge graphs for plasma physics, but also for nano safety, which is the research related to nanoparticles and the security and safety measures that are related to them, or for material sciences here, for example. On the other hand, we also um, turn archives into the digital age by making available semantic search technology also for archival goods as well as for libraries like our huge project with the German digital library where we right now are creating a knowledge graph to enable semantic and exploratory search. But many more projects we also have here in the cultural heritage domain and the domain of um, digital humanities. What is new is here a huge bunch of projects that we started uh, running in 2019 up to 2021. We have also proposed four additional ones here in the realm of the so-called national research data infrastructure. So these are huge projects where we have to do research data management for different scientific domains. So for example, we do this for NFDI for culture. This is cultural heritage domain for chemistry, for material sciences, MADI here. This is mathematics, data science here, and also here physics um, objects. This, this relates to archeology span or memory. This um, re relates to history science. And within these 10 years projects that we have here, so two phases per five years, we are going to establish uh, a unified access to research data from all of these domains. And this, of course, many times relies on knowledge graphs. So therefore, knowledge graphs are rather important for us. But first of all, let's talk about graphs. Everybody is representing nowadays data in terms of graphs because they are neat representations and visualizations for stuff you want to visualize. So here, for example, what you see here is a graph that um, contains keywords from scientific publications related to COVID. And what you see here are keywords from these publications and two keywords are connected by an arc. So this is a graph. You have nodes and edges or arcs between the nodes and two keywords are connected if they co-occur in a common document or in the same document. So you see here many different kinds of keywords and also the size of the nodes here, for example, represents um, the degree of the node, which means the number of incoming and outgoing edges here. However, this kind of graph is the rather standard or let's say flat graph in the sense that all of the edges you see here have all a standard or the same meaning and therefore interpretation is rather easy and you can do structural analysis up to topical analysis as you see here. But now let's progress to labels. For a label graphs, things are different. What we say here is um, we have on the edges specific labels and these labels carry a specific meaning. So for example, this here says that Leonard Nimoy start in the TV series Star Trek and he played there the character of Spock and Star Trek, of course, belongs somehow to, to the science fiction genre. On the other hand, we have Alec Guinness, who was the character, uh, uh, the guy playing the character of Obi-Wan Kenobi in the original Star Wars uh, series. So how do we know how to interpret this kind of graph? The computer, of course, would see something like that, which means all the labels are nice, but the only thing we can see here that, for example, these two nodes who have different labels are connected to a single node by an arc or an edge which has the same label, but we have no idea what that really means. So the interpretation, again, involves here definitely a human. So if you want to do uh, an application that is making use of that kind of data, so you, the human programmer, reads 
and understands the labels. And then he or she is going to encode the meaning, as far as she's understood it here, into software. Thereby the software then can interpret the data in a correct way. So it can understand the data according to how well the programmer understood that. No problem so far, but as we all know, things are changing. Panta Ray, everything flows, said already Heraclit in the sixth century BCE. So this means what happens with your software if new labels are introduced, if you want, for example, say that Spock comes from planet Vulcan, or if we simply change the labels. So we change the name of the label in the sense of, uh, instead of uh, saying um, plate, we say character in or character plate or something like that. If changes like this are happening in your graph, of course, you have to adapt your software probably not only once, but on every place and uh, line where exactly this kind of code or uh, data is accessed and is processed in the end. So this means this is probably a lot of effort that has to be invested if the graph that you are going to deal with is changing or is updated sometimes. So we see here the traditional solution is probably not always the most efficient one. What we want to enable nowadays is, of course, all of the data that we are using should be fair. So you have for sure heard of these famous fair principles. Data has to be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. However, the semantics, so the meaning of your labels here is implicitly encoded by our natural language. For that, if you want to enable interoperability, what you have to do is people are preparing natural language definitions for the use terms. So you have to de define a terminology and to create a glossary so that everybody in the end looks at that and writes down what the character or uh, the label that you are using here really means. Furthermore, then everybody has to agree to apply exactly these terminologies and glossaries that you have used. So this is kind of a standardization. Everybody has to use them. Otherwise, if you are the only one using them, it's not fair or it doesn't make sense. And you have to ensure somehow that everybody interprets the meaning that you have coded down in your terminology and your glossary that are given in natural language uniquely and in the same way. And here exactly lies the problem. You know natural language. If natural language only had one unique interpretation, the world would be really, really easy. The point is misunderstanding arises out of ambiguity, you can express the same thing in many different ways. And the same thing, depending on the context, can mean lots of different things. So this is the problem with language. We all know that. So therefore, the traditional solution, of course, has its flaws because everything depends here on natural language. However, there are knowledge graphs and we call them to the, to the rescue. But first, let's see what's a knowledge graph. I have brought here uh, a definition of one of my friends and colleagues by Heiko Paulheim. And he really generally said, what is a knowledge graph? A knowledge graph mainly describes real world entities and the interrelations. And this stuff is organized in a graph and it defines possible classes and relations of entities within a schema. And it allows for potentially interrelating arbitrary entities with each other. And in the end, of course, you can cover a variety of topical domains with it. Let's check our knowledge graph example that we had for exactly these things. So, yeah, of course, we describe real world stuff, entities and interrelations organized in a graph. Check. Uh, it allows potentially for interrelating arbitrary entities. So we can create here, for example, new edges with new meanings so, and we can connect these entities with each other. So that's a knowledge graph also check covers various topical domains. So here, of course, the, the domain of science fiction is covered. And yeah, the third thing, so or the last thing, it defines possible classes and relations of entities in a schema. So to make use of that graph, we need a schema behind that. So you see here what I have defined. I have here, for example, many definitions. So Obi-Wan Kenobi is kind of a fictional character, which is some special kind of an agent. And Alec Guinness here, for example, is a person which is some special special kind of creature and Star Wars is a film series, for example. 
the question is if I define these kind of classes, is this in the way I do it here already enough for being a knowledge graph? Hmm. What I want to do with the knowledge graph is, of course, I want to know that if Alec Guinness is a person, then of course, in the same time, he is also a creature simply because of person is some kind of a specialization. It's a subclass of creature. And I want to implement that. And this should hold, of course, in any circumstances here. However, how do I tell that my software? Hmm. Of course, let's stick to traditional solutions. This can be solved via individual software code, no problem. So I can, I put it here in, in, in pseudocode. So if I have here, for example, these um, note arc note combinations, which I refer to here as a triple, if I have Alec Guinness is a person, and if I say a person is a subclass of creature, then Alec Guinness is a creature. I encode exactly this into my program and I'm safe. I can even put there some variables instead of Alec Guinness and some variables instead of person and I'm safe again. However, I have to put this into my software. I have to quote, uh, create a procedure that exactly does this for me. Let's go a look further. Um, is Alec Guinness different from Star Wars? That's a bit tricky. So even so, we cannot really tell. We see we have here Star Wars is a film series. Alec Guinness is a person, which is a creature. Do we know that a creature is different from a film series? Not from the graph. We know it, of course, if we take our knowledge of the world, our background knowledge into there and see the implicit knowledge that is encoded within the names here. But we don't, the machine can, can't do that usually not. So therefore we need a bit more knowledge. For example, we have to declare creatures and film series to be two different things. Then we can do it. Again, via individual software, if Alec Guinness is a person and person is a subclass of creature and Star Wars is a film and film series is different from creature, then we can definitely also tell in the end that Star Wars is different from Alec Guinness. Hooray. However, to encode this in your software, you probably have to do a lot, lots of things for each individual graph you are dealing with. Even if you can use variables, for example, in that code, you always have to check this and you have to do this in a procedural way. Yeah, however, what's still not clear is what, what is the meaning now of the labels, even if we do exactly this kind of procedural translation. What are we doing here? Let's take a step step back in time because this kind of knowledge graphs if we as, as we saw them here are literally quite old so you see here a definition from the encyclopedia of artificial intelligence by john sober this definition from 1987 so this is already quite old and it states a semantic network and this is exactly what we are talking about or a net is a graph structure for representing knowledge in patterns of interconnected nodes and arcs and we know that computer implementations of semantic networks, they have been first developed for AI and machine translation, but already earlier versions have long been used in philosophy, psychology, and linguistics. Like for example, you might have heard of the Porphyrium tree of knowledge. This is kind of a you know decision procedure or visualization of um, the Aristotelian categories. So Aristotle, famous philosopher, and uh, Porphyr, late antiquity, he already in, uh, I guess, first, uh, second or third century, um, he, he created a graph structure representing these Aristotelian um, categories. And what you see here in the background is, for example, the knowledge that is covered in the great encyclopedia that was published by Diderot in the, and uh, D'Alembert in the 18th century. So these kind of graph visualizations of knowledge are quite old, but they all suffer from the same, let's say, flaw. How to interpret the text, the natural language that's in there. So we have first of all to cope with knowledge. So what is knowledge and how do we represent it in a way that the machine really can understand it? What's knowledge? From philosophy, you might know that, of course, the world, what we, what we see there, there are truths. And what is inside your head? This, of course, are your beliefs. And as you might know, not all of your beliefs might really coincide what is out there. So we don't know all truth. And only you see here, we have a small intersection of our beliefs and what is really true. 
But this is not knowledge. Knowledge is only a subset of that because these are the things that are in the intersection of beliefs and truths of which we really know that they are true. So we already know that. So therefore, traditional definition, knowledge is a subset of all true beliefs. And how do we share that knowledge? We need a language for that. Thomas Davenport already in the 1990s said, people can't share knowledge if they don't speak a common language. What does that mean? Speaking a common language means we have to use common symbols and concepts. That's the basic syntax. We have to agree about their meaning. This is the first term of semantics that we need here. Then, for example, for the concepts, we create a classification system. This is a taxonomy. We say which concepts relate or are associated with other concepts. You create a thesaurus. And then, of course, you also have rules and knowledge about which relations make sense, which relations between concepts are allowed, which are not allowed. And this, in the end, you do via ontologies. So what were ontologies again? We all have heard the term, but let's go a step back. Ontology is an old thing. So already in antiquity, in philosophy, they say they didn't call it ontology. They called it metaphysics then. So ontology in philosophy is a theory of being which tries to explain the being itself by developing usually systems of universal categories and their its intrinsic relationships. So exactly this thing that Aristotle also did in my example with the Porphyrian tree. However, in computer science, we have a much more pragmatic definition of that. Of course, it relates then to a data or structure that we are talking about. An ontology is an explicit formal specification of a shared conceptualization. This is the brief form of an on defining what is an ontology. But to understand what this concise definition means, you have to look at the single words. It's a conceptualization. Sure, we have an abstract model. It's explicit, which means all meaning of concepts must be defined, otherwise it's incomplete. It must be formal. This is one of the most important things. It has to be machine understandable. And of course, there must be consensus about how this ontology is used and what it means. So it should be shared. But the most important thing that our machine really understands that we need a formal grounding there. It has to be machine interpretable and machine understandable. This means the machine must be capable of interpreting the meaning, this is the semantics, of the knowledge rep representation correctly. Then it is able to understand it. So this is the most important concept. So, and now from here on, everything becomes explicit. So we want to represent the semantics of all of these labels in an explicit way. We can do this based on a kind of mathematical logic. You do this usually in the semantic web world with a kind of description logic. You state that Allegynes is a person, so person is a class, Allegynes is an instance of that. And you say that the class person is a subclass of creature. You can define this and write this down with description logics. And by that, by the means of description logic, and uh, by its formal semantics, by its, uh, with the help of its model theoretic interpretation, you are able to deduce that Allegynes, definitely, if you have the prerequisites here, is a creature. On the other hand, if you also define that Star Wars is a film series and film series and creature, these two classes, if you intersect them, they have an empty intersection. This means they are disjoint. They have no common element. Then it automatically can be deduced that Allegynes also is different from Star Wars. So this is the basic secret of formal logics and of reasoning. So this is exactly what we are after, meaning all of these labels that you have there must be grounded somewhere in a mathematical logic. Then you can do reasoning and then your program can take care of the content and doesn't have to think of all of the jobs that a reasoner can do anyway if you define things in logic. So then, of course, you apply a reasoner to get all these interesting results and you can materialize them and use them then later on in your program. So that's pretty nice. Which means by defining your knowledge graph exactly in that way, you have on the one side here, you have your terminological knowledge, which are the classes, and you have all of your instances or individuals that are then the members of these classes. And you see how they interrelate here with each other. And of course, the semantic web is one of the means how to encode this kind of knowledge and you can encode it there with the resource description format. So with RDF, the schema of RDF, so it's RDF schema and OWL, which is the ontology, uh, the web ontology language. And you see here, you encode here triples in a rather simple and easy 
expressible way. But I won't go deeper into that. This is simply to show you that it's possible, of course, to put meaning into all the stuff and it should be really taken. Um, so therefore I have here a first takeaway for you. If we compare the traditional way to develop software and to access the meaning of data, the semantics of the data has to be put in the program code. It is written by programmers and the interpretation of course depends on the individual programmer. So there can be mistakes simply because the programmer mistook the meaning of the things what he or she is using. And then another one using the program again probably interprets it in a different way and then we have the problem. This means in the end you end up with extensive software management, you know, which is necessary for any kind of data structure changes. And it's error prone because we have misunderstandings, misinterpretations by the programmer. On the other hand, if you do knowledge driven design there, then you, in your data, there is then the semantics. You encode it there explicitly, which is of course an old saying that you know in the semantic web or uh, logic community, you know this for uh, in the knowledge representation community, you know this for years now. There, it's written by the data provider. So this is the original source where the original understanding of the data really sits and the interpretation of the data is only dependent on its provider, which means in the end, less errors, less software maintenance, because you don't have to write in your software all these procedures, uh, what you have to combine and what follows, then you simply use a logical reasoner, which exists out there. On the other hand, tasks that are then quite simpler. If you put your meaning into the data, you have a simpler data integration and a simpler data re reuse. So this is what you gain if you are really using their knowledge in knowledge graphs. But what other kind of benefits do we have and how can we make use of it? First thing what we can do, of course, use this for data integration like we do it in our NFDI projects, the projects of the National Research Data Infrastructure. There we try to network all kinds of research data and you see here right now we have 20 different kind of consortia working there. So there should be 10 more coming then this year and next year. And uh, they are all organized in a two phase five plus five years project to organize all of their research data and interconnect it and try to provide a unified access to them. And to be able to do that, of course, not only standardized metadata or authority files are used, but of course also ontologies and knowledge graphs that are used as means for data interoperability and to ensure the implementation of these often cited FAIR principles. Another very important thing is semantic search and retrieval. In the center of the search and retrieval process, instead of a database, you simply put there a knowledge graph as a central element. Then this guides the index creation as well as the index usage or the ranking and the user interaction. So all of these things here are uh, supported then by the knowledge graph and this enables semantic and exploratory search. What does semantic search mean? This means that you go beyond documents and queries as bags of words. So there is meaning really in there. So you have a deeper understanding of your documents that you are searching in. So a deeper understanding of the document content. And what you do is you leverage world knowledge that you have knowledge about, you know, how things are interrelated to make more sense of what is really then in the documents. And as you see here in the graphics, so you have in your documents, so the mention of entities and of course in the knowledge graph, you can map them via entity linking and they are mapped here to ontologies where things are interrelated and you try to grasp the meaning and use this information to provide more means and more things in, the, in your search results. This means you go beyond the usual 10 blue links that you know from, from Google and you try to provide direct answers to your natural language questions. So question answering over knowledge graph, here is an example from my lecture, um, is quite easy. So what you do here is really you try to map the natural language phrased query into a so-called Sparkle query, which is a query language that makes use of these kind of triple patterns as we have already seen them. And you try to map them to a knowledge graph and generate the answer from that. So with that, it's really easy to create uh, or to answer so-called factoid questions. If you ask, for example, what's the nationally, uh, nationality of that guy, Abraham Ortelius, famous Dutch cartographer from the uh, yeah, golden age 
uh, from the Dutch Golden Age. And um, oh, I, uh, probably I said something completely wrong. He was, of course, from Brabant, so not from the Netherlands. So please, I'm not a historian, so um, don't kill me for that. But these kind of questions like which popes were in office during the lifetime of that guy or, you know, what kind of colleagues from from Frisia he had um, and they are what what other co-founders of cartography are there um, who's which colleague of Otelius died of kidney stones you can find out these things by using knowledge graphs like for example dbpedia or wikidata but you can go beyond that how to do that exploratory search what is exploratory search they're usually you don't do let's say a, a target driven search where you exactly have in mind what you are looking for you are going to search in an unknown terrain you are your, your search target is unclear to solve your query what you need are complex information to solve that and also it's not answered with let's say a, a single single result or a single line in that in, in the 10 blue lines that you get back from of results from from google what you want to do there is not to search for some specific target you want to rummage around somehow to see what's there what's going on what you do there usually is you follow these links and exactly these kind of edges that you have in your knowledge graph according to specific rules and by that you might find things that you haven't looked for in the first place so by surprise for example here we started our search let's say for Giorgio Vasari who is a, a renaissance author and artist who wrote biographies of famous artists for example and simply by looking who wrote about then this guy who was the author of, of that book so who wrote about Giorgio Vasari you might find Egon Friedel who wrote the cultural history of modern times and he was a guy who not really wrote in a favorite way about Giorgio Vasari however you might find out that he also is the creator of a famous science fiction novel which is the sequel to um, H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. So this is the return of the time machine here by Egon Friedel. So that might be rather interesting for you and you might find things like that by surprise. Problem with this kind of search often is, yeah, people are used to the Google kind of answers to these 10 blue links that you get back. You need new kind of visualizations for these kind of results and to make use of it. And this, of course, is often a very different thing. And for that, I can show you some things that we did years ago um, with, for example, exploratory search in a block that is called the Sky High block, a block of daily science uh, important events for uh, related to science and art. You can follow the link simply here. And here we are using um, semantically annotated blog posts. So this is a, a WordPress plugin that you can use. And if you link here a, a text fragment, the anchor text to a knowledge base, then of course you can directly here in the blog use visualizations that give you additional information about these entities without leaving here the context. But you can do even more. You can create visualizations. How do things within the document relate with each other and this might guide you to further search and uh, further results that you haven't expected before simply try it out with the link you see here besides semantic search and exploratory search another thing we are doing with the help of knowledge graph is to enable explainable ai and we do this for example for material sciences there we are using uh, ontologies to find out you know why did my experimental setup create a specific result why did my simulation come up with a specific result why did my prediction my 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 deep learning model uh, predict a specific uh, result here so why is that the case if we have a grounding in knowledge graphs we can simply follow then also an argumentation within there to justify for example experimental results we can check the plausibility of achieved results or we can find probably if the plausibility is not given we might see that there is a flaw in my experimental setup or in the description of my experiment so therefore i check for flaws in the representation of my experiment and in the end of course if i for example treat some p 
pieces of material in a specific way. I want to do a prediction, for example, what is afterward, if I heat, for example, some, some, some metal, I want to know then how does, how do specific material properties change? And if my model creates or my simulation creates a prediction, I can probably explain this kind of prediction based on the knowledge that I have encoded within a knowledge graph. So this is exactly what we are doing here in the material digital project. So besides all these huge benefits that you might have from these knowledge graphs, in case you are using knowledge in the way it is intended, there might be some pitfalls. And of course, we all want to avoid, avoid them. So if we are sailing here, the seven seas of knowledge graphs, we do not want to fall down on the edge of the earth or meet the dragon that uh, lures below. So we want to see what's going on there. First thing, if you have an ontology, Please keep in mind, ontologies are only a specific interpretation of reality. They are not the reality. They are the specific interpretation of reality with a focus, let's say, on a specific application or with a specific contextual background. You see this here with a famous example from Jorge Luis Borges, so famous author. He wrote in 1942 a, a nice little essay on the analytical language of John Wilkins where he gave us an example for exactly this kind of problem that might occur. So besides the uh, Linné-specific taxonomy of animals, there might be a complete different way to organize, to classify animals. So he says in a certain Chinese encyclopedia, he found the following classification system of animals. It's those that belong to the emperor, embalmed ones, those that are trained, suckling pigs, mermaids, fabulous ones, stray dogs, those that are included in this classification, those that tremble as if they were mad, innerable ones, those drawn with a very fine camel hairbrush, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you see, this, of course, is really hard to map to our standard interpretation, how we classify um, bio in biology. However, it might fit for your specific purpose. So therefore, please keep in mind ontologies uh, a specific interpretation. So what is here important, your ontology only makes sense if somebody else is using it in the same way like it is intended. So if somebody understand it in the same way, like, you know, um, you structured your knowledge there. So the consensus is really a rather important thing that you have to keep in mind. Another thing um, that I have to say, despite the huge effort of the largest public knowledge base out there of Wikidata and Wikibase, which is the basic software on which Wikidata builds, there is not much really semantics in there. So the knowledge in Wikidata is really hard to interpret as knowledge. Why is it so? Wikidata is basically a wiki. Of course, it's a wiki. And the system, if you look at it, so the base technology behind Wikidata is also a wiki system. So there is the media wiki, which is connected to a relational database through MariaDB. And there is a search index, Elasticsearch, and they have added on a small triple store, BlazeGraph, which is an RDF store, which you can query with, with a Sparkle interface. So there is, of course, some semantics in there in the BlazeGraph, but the central system, the main system here is still the wiki system, which means Wikibase is originally a wiki only and no native triple store. The database behind that is a relational one, so it doesn't contain semantics. The triple store is an add-on. And this attached triple store only contains so-called flat triples without specific explicit semantics. This is because the logic of Wikidata and Wikibase requires you to not use standard W3C defined semantic web vocabularies. So you can't really directly use RDF, RDFS and OWL definitions. You can't even use foreign vocabularies to express things. You only can use the Wikidata own vocabulary, which has no meaning because it is nowhere defined based on a logic. It's not automatically interpretable. There are no classes in that sense. There are no class hierarchy systems. So this is not strictly defined. There is no formal semantics. And further on, if you try to manipulate the triple store, there is no transparent synchronous bidirectional connection and interaction for that. So you only have to change things via an API, which is slow. This is another thing. But the main point 
here in the usage with Wikidata is no formal semantics. Why does it work anyway? Because people see what's in there and are interpreting it in a consensual way, which means if they write their software, they are interpreting the stuff as they see it. And this is not done in an automated way. So it could be much better, but unfortunately it isn't. And the very last trap I want you to avoid is the so-called complexity trap. Even if you build your ontology and you try to put all the knowledge you have in there and you have a rather high level of semantic expressivity, the knowledge graph based on that ontology might become unusual, unusable at a specific point because the things you are defining here are way too complex to solve exactly these kind of inference and deduction things that we saw in the beginning. Because if you are using a highly semantically expressive language like OWL2 to its full extent, things become in the end in undecidable, uncomputable. Or if you use subsets, specific ones, its time complexity, as you see here, it's beyond being hard. So it's uh, non-exponential time complete or non-exponential time hard. In the best case, if you use the smallest possible subsection there, it's even P space complete, which already kills you. P it means polynomial space complete. So nevertheless, it can take forever. So the semantic expressivity usually counteracts to compute complexity. So therefore you have to find out what exactly are you doing here? How can I create an ontology and a knowledge graph in a way that it's still manageable? So these things limit your scalability. So what you have to do, of course, how can you avoid that pitfall? Check your pragmatics. What exactly are you defining here? So when you design your ontology and your knowledge graph, have exactly in mind, what is your use case? What for what are you really needing the knowledge that you are defining here? Don't define things that you don't really know. Probably phrase your requirements and only represent what you really, really need to achieve your goal, to achieve your requirements. You do not have to, let's say, model the entire world if you only need a small subsection of what you really know. So and nobody really needs a Swiss army knife ontology, which can do everything. That would be also way too complex. You want to solve specific tasks with your ontology or you want to apply them in a specific domain. So if they are more abstract, like for example, domain ontologies or upper ontologies, they also serve a purpose. They should connect different tasks. They should connect different domains. This is their task. So therefore they don't have to be to the finest grain and to the finest level. And never ever underestimate query efficiency. If an information system is your goal that is based on a knowledge graph connected to an ontology, keep in mind that the queries that you might need to get to the information, they have to follow simple patterns. If the queries become too complex to solve, then again, it's of no use to really apply then your perfect ontology. So this is the takeaway of this lecture. However, it's not as bad as it seems. So semantics has gone a long way. A little semantics has gone a long way as one of my famous colleagues, one of the founding fathers of the uh, semantic web team handler said. And you see this in every day in the linked open data cloud, which is constantly growing. And there is even more than just the linked data cloud. I have looked in the latest results of the web common crawl. You see here, there are millions of websites that are using JSON LD now as the main format in the web for expressing RDF and um, semantic stuff, which in the end comes up to almost 40 billion triples of knowledge which are out there and which might be used by you. So what can you take home from my talk? First of all, not all knowledge graphs are created equal. Knowledge, therefore, is here an important issue and how it is represented in the knowledge graph. Ontologies, you know that, are formal knowledge representations. And knowledge can be represented in many different ways. Always keep your focus on what are you, for, for what reason, for what use case are you needing this kind of knowledge that you're going to represent. But in the end, what you can do with it, where you can benefit from it is, of course, with ontologies and knowledge graphs, you enable better interoperability, you enable a complete new search experience with better and more complete results in semantic search, and you can find things you even have known that you are looking for them in exploratory search, and you can explain with knowledge graph 
your answers that your other your sub symbolic um, knowledge representation AI technology like deep learning and machine learning produces in the end that can be explained based on a knowledge graph. That's all. Thank you very much. And now I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs>